Now, our next two stories are about whistleblowers. And it turns out that uh, and these are two new whistleblower stories, actually, that we haven't covered before. It turns out that whistleblowers are turning out to be some of our best defense against criminal actions by the government. It is really necessary and very welcome. We're all very grateful to the people who come forward and speak out when they see the government doing criminal things, things that are unconstitutional. In this particular case, this is reported, this is exclusive from foreign policy. They say that a whistleblower it says that the State Department is trying to bully her into silence. The State Department investigator who accused colleagues last week of using drugs, soliciting prostitutes, and having sex with minors. Oh, maybe these pedophile networks that uh, Alex is constantly telling everybody about, says that Foggy Bottom is now engaged in an intimidation campaign to stop her. After the CBS News made inquiries in the State Department about the charges, Schulman says investigators from the State Department's Inspector General promptly arrived at her, at her door. They talked to both kids and never identified themselves, she said. First, the older brother, then the younger daughter, and a minor asking for their mom's place of work, cell phone number, and they camped out for four to five hours. Schulman says the purpose of the visit was to get Fedenism to sign a document admitting that she stole State Department materials, such as the memos leaked to CBS. Schulman says it was crucial that she did not sign the document because her separation agreement with the State Department includes a provision allowing for disclosures of misconduct. And she said none of the materials were classified. Now this is exactly what they did to the NSA whistleblower that they, uh, we, we talked about on Monday. There were three major whistleblowers and uh, Jim Drake was one that they came after and tried to get him for improper handling of documents. They said they found documents at his apartment that were uh, classified, although it turned out that he didn't have any classified documents. And some of the documents had been retroactively classified after they found them at his apartment. So in both of these cases, they're trying to use very tenuous means to try to persecute these people. And they were very intimidating with her. They threatened her children, camped out there for four or five hours, and said that they would uh, be coming after her for criminal charges, threatening criminal charges. And that brings us to our quote of the day. And this quote is from Bill Moyers. And he says, secrecy is the freedom tyrants dream of. And that is very true. You know, we talked about when we were covering Bilderberg, how ironic it was that at the same time all these scandals are breaking, that are showing people what we've been talking about, what Alex has been talking about for decades, and that is the government is collecting everyone's information, storing it, spying on everybody, doesn't believe that anyone has any right to any kind of privacy, and yet they maintain what they do in absolute secrecy. They demand the ultimate secrecy. And so we see as individuals lose their secrecy, lose their privacy, government continually gains more and more secrecy. It's kind of a zero-sum game, just like uh, freedom and tyranny is a zero-sum game. Now, another thing that's coming out from whistleblowers is information about the TWA 800 crash, that it was not due to gas tank explosion, and this is former investigators coming forward and talking about it. These former investigators, whose credentials range from the NTSB, TWA, Airline Pilots Union, and forensic experts, now claim that radar and forensic evidence shows the wiring was not the cause of the crash. The, the explosive forces came from outside the airplane, not the center fuel tank. The agenda was that this is an accident, make it so. I remember this when it happened 17 years ago. And I remember there was a lot of chatter. There wasn't an internet. There wasn't much of an alternative media at the time. But people were still communicating, let's say on bulletin boards, that sort of thing. There was still communication going on. And much of it was in alternative news publications, hard copy. And there was a lot of information about how the government was going around and uh, taking information from witnesses and essentially kind of doing a, not just a, a perfunctory investigation, but uh, covering up and taking data away that investigators had. And that's exactly what we see in this article. In the article, it says that producers of an upcoming documentary on TWA Flight 800, which exploded and crashed into the waters off Long Island on July 17, 1996, killed all 230 people on board. And they, these producers claim to have proof that an explosion outside the Paris-bound flight caused the crash 
and six former investigators who took part in the film say that there was a cover-up and they want the case reopened. Again, whistleblowers coming forward and talking about what was covered up. They go on to say Jim Spear, an accident investigator at the time of the crash for the Airline Pilots Association, who shifted through the recovered wreckage in a hangar, said he discovered holes consistent with those that would be formed by a high-energy blast in the right wing. He requested it be tested for explosives, and when the test came back positive, he was physically removed from the room by two CIA agents. Dozens of eyewitnesses in the Long Island area also recall seeing something resembling a flare or a firework that was ascending, not descending, and culminating in an explosion, the CIA said in a 2008 report. Had the crash been the result of state-sponsored terrorism, it would have been considered an act of war, said the CIA report. Now, listen to this recording that was part of the air traffic control chatter at the time between the air traffic control and commercial airline pilots who saw the explosions. We saw two fireballs go down to the, there seemed to be a light, I thought it was a landing light iron, it was coming right at us in about, about 15,000 feet or something like that, and I thought they had a landing light on, maybe it was a fire, I don't know. So he said he saw something that he thought at first had landing lights turned on, and he turned on his landing lights to make sure it didn't collide with him. And then he, as he thought about it, he said, well, maybe it was a fire, maybe it wasn't landing lights. And as you saw in that video roll, the uh, su supposition is that it's either a terrorist attack. Most people, however, believe that it wasn't a surface-to-air sho shoulder missile from terrorists. There was a nearby naval exercise going on at the time. And many people believe that this was a cover-up by the U.S. government to keep people from realizing that perhaps an aberrant missile took that plane down. Now, at the time, approximately, according to Wikipedia, approximately 80 FBI agents conducted interviews with potential witnesses daily. Yet, listen to what they did. No verbatim records of the witness interviews were produced. Instead, the agents who conducted the interviews wrote summaries that they then submitted into the investigation. And witnesses were not asked to review the summaries. They were not asked to correct the summaries. And included in some of the witness summaries were drawings or diagrams of what the witnesses observed, but of course, the FBI was not interested in that. And it is also very unusual for the FBI to even investigate a crash like that. That's usually done by the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. And so there were a lot of questions being asked at the time. People who asked those questions were being called, guess what, conspiracy theorists. If you don't believe implausible explanations that are put out by the government, if you question those, you're called a conspiracy theorist. But in reality, what you are is what people used to call skeptics, or maybe just journalists. They're trying to do an honest job. And now we see, 17 years later, we see several people coming forward because they're bothered by this cover-up. And I think it'll be a very interesting documentary. I think it'll be very much like A Noble Lie, which really put together, summarized uh, so many aspects of the Oklahoma City bombing and told the real true story that was never told in the media. Now, we also have a video that is being put out by the same producers of A Noble Lie. It's State of Mind, Psychology of Control, and it's pre-booking now at InfoWars, and we have an exclusive on that for at least 90 days. It's the only place you can get it, and right now, if you pre-book, you can get a free video with that that explains in a very entertaining cartoon way how the Federal Reserve and money works. So take a look at that. It's a great way to wake people up. When we cover stories in the news, we have to cover the high points. We cannot go in depth to give the full uh, explanation, the full background, all the investigation, all the evidence that people can uncover in documentaries. It's a great way to wake people up. Now, it's not just assassinations by drones. It's not just uh, mafia car bombings of journalists like we were talking about earlier. Murder is really a way of life for the Washington feds. And we have a Pulitzer Prize winning author pointing that out in a new book. President Obama's secret CIA hit squad is detailed in The Way of the Knife. This is a story from The New American. This is a story behind the development and deployment of this presidential killing corps told in The Way of the Knife, the CIA, a secret army, and a war at the ends of the earth. Latest book by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Mark Mazzetti. Now, President Barack Obama has converted the CIA, he says, into his personal army and granted it unfettered assassination authority. 
And just as the CIA has come on to take tasks traditionally associated with the military, with spies turned into soldiers, just the opposite has also occurred. The American military has been dispersed in the dark spaces of American foreign policy with commando teams running spying missions that Washington would have never dreamed of approving in the years before 9-11. Prior to the attacks of September 11, the Pentagon did very little human spying and the CIA was not officially permitted to kill. Not officially, of course. In the years since, each has done a great deal of both and a military intelligence complex has emerged to carry out the new American way of life. Now, the sad thing about this is that, as he points out, as we learned in the Church Commission, uh, the CIA was very much in the assassination business. But what we're seeing now is a government that is absolutely unashamed of its criminal, unconstitutional, immoral, unlawful un uh, assassinations. I mean, what else can you say about it? And yet they do it in the open. They do it without anyone going to jail. And they're basically flaunting these, these murders. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show.